Welcome to the controversial statements in Spencer W. Kimball's book, The Miracle of Forgiveness. And uh, Spencer W. Kimball is pictured above. This is the picture from the book. All right. The Miracle of Forgiveness came out in 1969 and was published by Bookcraft. Uh, that was a church uh, publisher that put out a lot of books from between like 1942 and the year 2000. And here is the title page from the edition that I used. Uh, I used the 1975 edition, which was the 20th printing uh, for this video. Spencer W. Kimball wrote the book when he was in his early 70s. So Kimball was one of the senior apostles at the time that he wrote this book. He's pictured above here on the left. Uh, he had been an apostle for over 25 years by the time that the book came out. And then about four years later, he became the prophet of the church. All right, so this book, The Miracle of Forgiveness, has sold at least 1.6 million copies, making it one of the top-selling Mormon books of all time. The church still publishes it publishes it in an e-book format, an electronic book, but if you walk into a Deseret book, uh, they no longer publish it in uh, physical form. They're trying to get away from this book. And uh, this video is going to show you why that's the case. Uh, this book has been printed in 16 languages. So it's gone, gone all over the world. And this book was routinely distributed to departing Mormon missionaries, pictured above, engaged LDS couples, pictured above, and members disciplined for sexual sin. So they gave the book to the missionaries, engaged couples, and those that had committed adultery or fornication or masturbation or sins of homosexuality, etc. cetera. Uh, this is no longer the case. It is not distributed to any of these folks uh, any longer. The prophet Ezra Taft Benson urged all members to read and reread President Spencer W. Kimball's book, The Miracle of Forgiveness. So it was recommended by some, some high church leaders. Of course, uh, Benson is pictured above. All right, so let's get to some of the controversial statements in this book. Uh, there is quite a few. There's 86 more slides. <laughs> so the Apostle Kimball hopes that his book will help people to purify and perfect their lives. Not make progress, not do your best, but to reach for perfection, whatever the heck that is. <laughs> this is very problematic. I probably don't need to explain this to most people. Uh, but, but striving for, perfect, for perfection is impossible. There are many diff different definitions of what perfection is. Uh, there's many different ways to live your life compared to what uh, many different ways to live your life depending on what you you are passionate about. All right, there's also this concept that the Mormons have the only true church on the face of the planet, which the church has kind of gotten away from as well. But it is uh, mentioned many times in this book. Uh, the message of repentance is to all the world, Kimball says not only to members of the true church, the Mormons. So, of course, Mormons are the only true church on the planet uh, for Kimball. All right, so what is the goal of mankind? Well, Kimball tells us in the book over and over and over again, it is to become omniscient, which is all-knowing, and omnipotent, which is all-powerful. That's, that's our goal <laughs> as humans. So he says, God created man to live in mortality, this life now, and endowed him with the potential to perpetuate the race, to have children, to subdue the earth. That's kind of a, a negative connotation now for environmentalists, subduing the earth, and to perfect himself, we've talked about that, and to become as God, to become as God, omniscient and omnipotent and of course the church has kind of gotten away from that as well they don't really like talking about how members can become gods uh, just find some of Gordon B Hinckley's statements to Larry King on YouTube where he tries to distance himself from that concept now 
All right. Kimball continues here. He says, for man and man alone was the earth created, organized, and planted. The earth, the earth is for man. Screw all the other animals, <laughs> all the insects, all the creatures in the seas. The earth was not made for them, only for us. Uh, the earth was made ready for human habitation and that having within him the seeds of godhood and thus being a god in embryo, man has unlimited potential for progress. So there again, he, he says the goal of mortality, of, of living in this life is to become a god someday. All right, so then Kimball makes a statement that will be offensive to atheists and agnostics as myself, uh, Kimball says, if there were no God, life would indeed be meaningless. <clears throat> so if God doesn't exist, life has no meaning. Well, what about the things that you're passionate about? What about, what about the things you enjoy doing as an individual human being that has free will? In other words, we make our own meaning. All right, here's another statement about how you can become a god. This is all throughout this book. I didn't count how many times he mentions that the, that the goal of life is to become a god, but it's quite a few times. He says, the third state, which is immortality, would incorporate exaltation, eternal life with godhood. That's us as individuals. We will, If we do everything we're supposed to according to the church, we will have eternal life with Godhood for those for those who would fully magnify their mortal lives. All right, so where can you go to get this exaltation uh, to become a God? Well, Kimball says there is only one place, one religion, and that is the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. That's it, folks. You cannot get exaltation, salvation anywhere else except the Mormon church. No other religion, no other spiritual system, nothing. Everybody will have to come to the church either in this life or in the next. And it's kind of crazy because the Mormons represent such a small percentage of the population on earth. Right now, they're like, they're like 0.1% of the population. 0.1%, not 1%, 0.1% of the population is Mormon, that is active Mormons. And if you look throughout history, the history of mankind, <clears throat> it's a lot less than that from, from all the people that have lived. What, maybe 100 billion people? It's a lot smaller than 0.1%. But all those people... <laughs> that lived in false religions will have to come to the Mormon church after they die, if they haven't heard it here. Kimball says the, the Mormon church is the sole repository of this priceless program in its fullness, the program for exaltation. It is the sole repository. All right, so what are some of the minor infractions uh, that will prohibit you from becoming a god prohibit you from getting your exaltation well one of them is drinking coffee <laughs> you drink coffee you can't be saved Kimball states that church members who drink coffee will not receive exaltation so some of these I've kind of uh, paraphrased what he said in the book and some of them are actual quotes so if I say Kimball states the following that's a paraphrase all right, so Kimball gives us a recipe for life. <laughs> and in my mind, it's a miserable life. He says, sin will be forgiven to those who totally, consistently, and continuously repent. Living a life of repentance daily. <laughs> what, a, what a message for misery continuously repenting for every little thing you do every single day that maybe you shouldn't have done. To err is human. <laughs> S 
Sin will be forgiven to those who totally, consistently, and continuously repent every day of their lives. Talk about a recipe for shame and guilt. All right, so what sins and weaknesses need to be overcome in order that we can be saved and receive our exaltation and become gods? Well, Kimball tells us all of it. <laughs> Every single thing, every single transgression, every single weakness has to be overcome. This is what he says. All transgressions must be cleansed. All weaknesses must be overcome before a person can obtain perfection and godhood. Nobody's ever going to obtain perfection in this life. There's no reason that needs to be the goal. How about daily progress? And another thing Kimball does in his book is to put the fear of Satan deep within your psyche and your heart. And that's why when I grew up in the church, a lot of people had this deep-seated fear of Satan. Still probably there in the church to some extent. Uh, so Kimball talks about the battle with Satan. Pictured above, uh, a.k.a. Lucifer in the temple ceremony. That's what he looked like when I went through. I, uh, he's probably not in there anymore. He's just a man in some robes. Or maybe now in a suit. All right, so Kimball talks about the battle with Satan. What does he say? He says Satan is clever. He's highly trained. He has thousands of years of experience, is superbly efficient, determined, and has superior powers compared to man. Wow. <laughs> I'm scared, very scared of Satan. I'm scared that I can't win the battle against Satan. He's too clever. He has too much experience. Thousands of years. He has superpowers. How am I supposed to stand up to him? All right. Kimball lists the following as sins. Uh, one of them was disobedience to husbands. That's a sin. Women are supposed to be obedient to the husband. And that's what Mormons had to take an oath of obedience to their husband in the temple. When I grew up, that oath is no longer in there in the temple ceremony. But for Kimball in 1969, women were to be obedient to their husbands. And if they were not, it was a sin. Also, other sins, masturbation, petting, and homosexuality. All right, a topic that Joseph Smith and Brigham Young used to talk a lot about even those that followed uh, John Taylor, third prophet, maybe even uh, Wilford Woodruff after him. They used to teach a lot that the end was near. The millennium was just around the corner and we had to get ready for the apocalypse or for Armageddon. Church no longer talks about that anymore. <clears throat> so Kimball quoting Joseph Smith states that the end of the world is near. Don't delay the day of your repentance because there's not much time left. All right, so it's also interesting how Spencer W. Kimball thought of women. So he came up with some sins that wives commit. <laughs> and uh, I think they're pretty controversial, some of them. Wives can be too demanding. They can be quarrelsome. Instead of being obedient, they're quarrelsome and they're uncooperative. Women and wives should not be quarrelsome and uncooperative. They should obey their husbands. And there's still some of that in the church today because men have the priesthood and women don't. Men are the head of the household. Women can also be too worldly. <laughs> so 
So those are some sins that women commit. All right, so talk about the pot calling the kettle black. In other words, being a hypocrite. Kimball says that intolerance and prejudice are sins. When Kimball, in this book and in other places, is totally intolerant of gays and lesbians, homosexuals, LGBT people, totally prejudiced and intolerant against them. He doesn't see that. He can't see that. He thinks those are sins. <clears throat> He's also intolerant and prejudiced against black people because this was 1969. Black people could not have the priesthood <clears throat> or go to the Mormon temple to receive their saving ordinances until 1978, so about uh, nine years later. He doesn't see this. <laughs> He's a hypocrite. All right, Kimball says that educational degrees and titles can also become sins. If you focus too much on that and not on the kingdom of God, maybe you delay having kids in your family. These degrees and titles can become sins. <laughs> Kimball says that young married couples who postpone parenthood until their degrees are attained are sinners. <laughs> no, it's not just a, a logical choice that, hey, maybe I should get a degree so I can make some money so I can take care of my family. No, in the Mormon church, you're not supposed to postpone parenthood. You're supposed to be going to college, even grad school, whatever you're doing while you're having kids, while you're married. Kimball says that people should not focus on hunting, fishing, vacations, weekend outings, or sports. Yeah, why should they? Why should they enjoy their lives doing the things that they like to do? <laughs> Too bad for you hunters, fishers, people that like to go on vacation, weekend outings, or sports. Shouldn't be focused on that. Because these pursuits, more often than not, interfere with the worship of the Lord and with giving service to the building up of the kingdom of God. That's all you're supposed to be doing with your time, is doing church work and church service and building up the kingdom. That's where the majority of your time should be spent. You, sh you should be like Spencer Kimball, dedicate, dedicate your whole entire life to this cause. So if you are committing some of these sins, Kimball says the church should come down hard on you, the church leadership, your bishop, your stake president. If you're committing some of these sins, like going hunting on the weekends, <laughs> taking a vacation because <laughs> you're working so hard in the church. See, the church likes to make you believe that it's all about free agency, free will, but really it's not. You don't get to do what you want to do in the church. You get to obey the leaders. You get to obey apostles like Spencer W. Kimball, and they tell you to, to spend most of your time working in the church, especially if you have a high calling, even above and beyond your own family spending time with your family. If you're a bishop or stake president, man, your life is in that freaking church, in that chapel, interviewing people and God, I feel bad for him. But if you've committed some of these sins, if you've masturbated, if you talk back to your husband when you sh should have obeyed, if you went hunting when you should have been cleaning the church building, these people are to be chastised and punished and disfellowshipped and excommunicated before they realize that their plight, before they realize their plight and the need to transform their lives. So he's, this book is a harsh book. That's why the church is kind of getting away from this now. All right. So uh, what about apostates? Well, Kimball intimates 
that no good Mormon loves or admires traitors like John C. Bennett, he's pictured above on the left. Nobody should love or admire John C. Bennett, the damned apostate. Nobody should love or admire William Law, pictured on the right, or Francis and Chauncey Higby. <clears throat> These are all apostates and traitors. We shouldn't love them. It, doesn't, that, doesn't that go against what the Savior said? All right, so what about alcohol? Well, Kimball says that drinking alcoholic beverages curses all who touch it. <laughs> drinking alcohol curses all who touch it. Strong language here. Alcohol brings deprivation and sorrow. It is associated with graft, immorality, gambling, fraud, gangsterism, and most other vices. Alcohol has everything against it and nothing for it. <laughs> well, 50% of Americans drink alcohol fairly regularly, at least once a month. Half of the population of the United States, I don't know what it is for other countries, but a lot of other developed countries, it's pretty high too, probably even higher. If you go to Ireland, the UK, Germany, a lot of drinkers, and they do it responsibly. Have one or two drinks in a social situation is very common, and people can handle it. A lot, most people can. These are just your average, every everyday, ordinary people. They're not engaged. They're not gangsters. <laughs> They're, they're not gamblers associated with graft, but that's what Kimball wants you to believe. All right, what about smoking marijuana cigarettes? <laughs> or hitting the bong? <laughs> I wonder why Kimball didn't say hitting the bong is sinful. He doesn't know what a bong is. He says smoking marijuana cigarettes is sinful and will lead to more serious drug habits and to the addict's spiritual, moral, and physical downfall. Well, there's millions of people that use marijuana responsibly as well. Millions of people that use medical marijuana responsibly for things that ail them. A lot of people, it never does lead to more serious drug habits. For a lot of people, marijuana is not addictive. It can be done responsibly, and that's why it's becoming legal all over the country. All right, so what about the young man growing up in the church who commits fornication? In other words, having sex. <laughs> Fulfilling his biological need to have sex. Well, that's really close to murder. According to Kimball and according to the church, having sex is next to murder unless you're married. So here in a letter to a young LDS man, Kimball says, Your sin of fornication is the most serious thing you could have done in your youth this side of murder. <laughs> Why isn't having premarital sex illegal? simply a biological need. All right, so then Kimball quotes the prophet David O. McKay. When this book came out, uh, David O. McKay was the prophet. McKay said, uh, Your virtue is worth more than your life. Please, young folk, preserve your vir virtue. Preserve your virtue even if you lose your lives. And what situation are you going to have to lose your life to preserve your virtue? Rape? Are you supposed to fight back? Even if the guy kills you? All right, McKay, pictured above. All right, and then Kimball quotes a very controversial passage from the prophet Heber J. Grant. Grant said, and he's pictured above, 
Sexual sins, if indulged in, are worse than death itself. Really? <laughs> biological sex. A biological need is worse than death. There is no true Latter-day Saint who would not rather bury a son or a daughter, who would not rather bury them, than to have him or her lose his or her chastity. I'll repeat it. There is no true Latter-day Saint who would not rather bury a son or a daughter than to have him or her lose his or her chastity. So when does this situation come up? If you have the choice between dying and, and being buried or keeping uh, sexually pure. Are they talking about rape? All right. So what else... What other minor infraction? <laughs> I wouldn't even call it an infraction or a sin, but Kimball does. What other minor infraction is a pernicious evil? Well, it's simply kissing when you're a teenager and not married. Kimball describes necking or kissing as a sin and a pernicious evil. Kissing. Pernicious evil, really? All right, so what about petting? Touching each other all over your body with your hands. It's safe sex, right? You're not going to have a baby doing that. You're not going to get a disease doing that. Just simply touching each other with your hands all over, all over the other person's body. But Kimball describes petting as disgraceful, reprehensible, and a foul act. All right, so what does petting lead to? Well, Kimball says it leads to sorrow, anguish, and remorse. Well, only if, if that's what you believe. <laughs> if you don't believe that it's evil, it's not going to lead to any of those things. <clears throat> Control the thoughts of your mind. Discover what is true. Petting leads actually to the opposite. <laughs> Happiness, joy, pleasure. If you don't believe all this crap that sex and kissing and petting is evil. All right, so why should women stay at home and raise the children? Why should women not be able to work outside of the home? Well, Kimball says it is because of the presence of other men where they are exposed to flirtations. <laughs> Can't go out into the office because there's other men there. They might flirt with you. They might display, they might show a display of interest or affection and confidences, he says. Well, there's pretty strict rules against that sort of stuff nowadays in the workplace. Sexual harassment, it's a big deal. Maybe you could get away with some of this mildly mild flirtation, display of interest, affection. You can't certainly can't touch anybody. And leering is uh, certainly looked down upon nowadays. But Women can't work, according to Kimball, because of what the men will do to them. <laughs> the men can't control themselves. He also quotes Boyd K. Packer, who says the father or the man should be the head of the family. The man or father should be the head of the family. All right, so sexual sin results in suffering and torture remorse and deprivation well only if you look at it the way that Kimball looks at it if you don't have any of these crazy conservative beliefs you're not going to experience the su suffering or torture only if you have these Mormon beliefs and you go in and talk to your bishop and confess it and feel all the things that Kimball tells you that you should feel Instead of feeling like it's normal, it's biological, it uh, is pleasurable, 
And we do it in a safe way. We use birth control. We use condoms. But according to the Mormon way, the shame and guilt is so bad, the sexual sin results in suffering and torture and remorse and deprivation. All right, so what about the adulterer who does it a number of times, multiple times? Well, Kimball says that adultery can only be forgiven one time. Yep, go and read it, page 72 and 73. Adultery can only be forgiven one time. It's the worst sexual sin, except maybe being homosexual, <laughs> which we'll go over plenty of slides on that. The person who repeats the sin should be cast out or excommunicated. Does that really still happen nowadays? The person that commits adultery and then they get forgiven and then they do it again. I don't think they're cast out or excommunicated in the church anymore. All right, so again, Kimball says that the man is the head of the family and the woman should be a kind, considerate help meet to her husband. <laughs> Man's the head of the family. The woman should be a nice helper, a help meet to the husband. And of course, Thomas S. Monson, who also uh, went on to become the prophet, said the same thing in an Enzyme article, or maybe a talk in uh, 1971. Two years after this book came out, maybe he was thinking of this book <laughs> when he made that uh, statement. You, the help meet, are not the head of the family. You don't have the priesthood. All right, so what about masturbation? Well, Kimball condemns masturbation. He says that it is detrimental to spirituality and indicates slavery to the flesh. <laughs> they never talk about it being a biological need if you're not getting any you don't have a girlfriend masturbation is your best option he also states that our modern prophet David O. McKay has indicated that no young man should be called on a mission who is not free from masturbation in other words if you're committing masturbation, you can't go on a mission. That's according to David O. McKay, the prophet of the church at this time, 1969. And we know that uh, it's, in, it's in the 90 percentile <laughs> of teenage boys as they go on their mission when they're 18 or 19. So they're pretty much an adult. We know that it's in the 90 percentile of boys that that age group are masturbating if they're not getting regular sex so all this means is that people at this time were lying these these young men were lying so that they could go on missions they're lying so they could go through the temple almost all of them are masturbating <laughs> so they just have all this unnecessary uh, guilt and shame and of course picture to Bible we have a bishop's interview with one of these youth the, the young man's got his hands up in the air so you know what what's the big deal with masturbation well it's a really bad sin and it also depends on what bishop you had some bishops really strong against it uh, some were not all right so here's one of the most famous statements or quotations from this book masturbation requires sincere repentance <laughs> good luck with that <laughs> it's a hopeless case man 90 percent of the young men are going to be doing this they're going to be repenting like every week for the rest of their lives that's why i think they just have to come into terms with their mind the young, the youth's mind that, hey, masturbation does not require repentance. <laughs> or else, how are they going to be able to survive? But Kimball says, masturbation requires sincere repentance 
it too often leads to grievous sin, even to that sin against nature, homosexuality. <laughs> so if you're stroking your own dick, you're probably going to want to stroke some other guy's dick, right? Is that his logic? <laughs> I don't know what his logic is here. It's crazy. You're interested in your own dick. You're jerking yourself off. That means you're going to turn gay. You're going to be interested in dicks. <laughs> There's a big difference between jerking yourself off and jerking somebody else off or having sex with somebody uh, of the same gender. Uh, for, for done in private, it evolves often into mutual masturbation. Bullshit. <laughs> if I'm sitting around with my friends... And I'm not gay. There's no way I'm going to be jerking off in front of them. And there's no way, if I'm not gay, that I'm going to, that I'm going to start doing mutual masturbation. Ah, for done in private evolves often into mutual masturbation practiced with another person of the same sex and thence into total homosexuality. That's what causes people to be gay and homosexual. Masturbation. There's no inborn tendency. <laughs> They're not attracted. God would never make you so you were attracted to the same sex. It must be masturbation that leads to it. And then the sign here says, Stop shaming our youth to death. If you got the, the youth that's repenting constantly of masturbation, that could lead to suicidality. Or if you're homosexual and aren't able to act out upon it and you just keep being told that you're a sinner and your thoughts are sinful and basically your your nature as a gay person, that can shame you to death. And it has led to a, a lot of uh, gay and lesbian youth killing themselves. All right, so what words does he use to describe homosexuality? He says it's ugly. It's a sin. It's embarrassing and unpleasant. Homosexuality is an ugly sin. It is an embarrassing and unpleasant subject. And that doesn't stop him from dealing with it in this book. We, we got to stop all this homosexuality going on. All right. He also uses some other words to describe homosexuality. He calls it a perversion, it is revolting, abominable, and detestable. I think he doesn't like homosexuals. Pictured above here, uh, let me marry who, who I love. Let me marry who I love. All right, so masturbation leads to homosexuality. Well, what leads to having sex with animals? Well, he tells us. Thus it is that through the ages, perhaps as an extension of homosexual practices. <clears throat> so there you go. Maybe as an extension of homosexual practices, men and women have sunk even to seeking sexual satisfactions with animals. <laughs> donk, 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 donk. Hitting my head with a mic. Masturbation leads to homosexuality. Homosexuality leads to having sexual satisfaction with animals. Where in the hell is he getting this information? Okay, so what does Kimball think of LGBT, bisexuals, pansexuals, transgender, genderqueer, and asexual people? These are all deviations from the normal, proper heterosexual relationships. Those are all deviations. The only acceptable way to be is heterosexual. All these other things are not merely unnatural, but they are wrong in the sight of God. All those people are wrong in the sight of God. LGBT, bisexual, pansexual, transgender, genderqueer, asexual, all the other ones that they're talking about nowadays 
or wrong in the sight of God. The only proper people are heterosexuals. Like adultery, incest, and bestiality, they carried the death penalty under the Mosaic Law. That's true. <laughs> you wonder where the Christians and the Mormons get these ideas. They get them out of the Bible, especially the Old Testament. Well, even Paul uh, talks about homosexuality being a sin. So being a homosexual or one of these other ones carries the death penalty in the Old Testament. All right, I have to say that this is one of the funnest videos to make, or at least uh, to do the audio for, because <laughs> uh, some of the crazy stuff he says in here. Uh, homosexuality is a grave sin, a deviant belief, which leads to the deterioration of society. Uh-oh. Gays being gays is going to lead to the deterioration of society. He's going to talk about Sodom and Gomorrah here pretty soon. Kimball says that homosexuality should be illegal. All right, so he says even if everybody in the world accepts the homosexuals, kind of the way that it, the, the world is trending nowadays, the practice of being a homosexual would still be a deep, dark sin. And he says uh, in Sodom and Gomorrah, they seem to accept homosexuals. Pretty much uh, everybody in Sodom and Gomorrah said that homosexuality was okay, but that is not true. It's still a deep, dark sin. All right, so here we go again. Uh, those who claim that the homosexual is a third sex, we talked about a lot more than, than that, but those who claim that there's a third sex and that there is nothing wrong in such associations, those people can hardly believe in God. If you believe there's more than just heterosexuals out there, if you believe in this third sex or fourth, fifth, sixth, whatever he wants to call it, and you believe there's nothing wrong in these homosexual associations, these people can hardly believe in God. All right, because of the seriousness of the sin of homosexuality, it carries a heavy penalty for the unrepentant. Let it therefore be clearly stated that the seriousness of the sin of homosexuality is equal to or greater than that of fornication or adultery. So... He says it's one of the very worst sins that you can commit. Uh, it's next to murder. All right, so what is the church going to do uh, to these homosexuals? Kimball says the Lord's church will as readily take action to disfellowship or excommunicate the unrepentant practicing homosexual as it will the unrepentant fornicator or adulterer. So... There you go. Homosexuality is next to murder. It's as bad as adultery. People that are going to practice it will be disfellowshipped or excommunicated. Uh, I'm not sure if they still do that today. I know that they are not allowed to practice it. They can be homosexual in their mind, but as soon as they take an action to satisfy their homosexual desire, uh, they're in sin. Okay, in order to assist the homosexual back to normal living, quote unquote, <laughs> back to normal living, the church has appointed two of its general authorities to help on a church level. Many have been helped through this rehabilitation program. One of the rehabilitation programs they had was at BYU, and it involved electroshock therapy as pictured above. You've probably seen uh, one flew over the cuckoo's nest with Jack Nicholson. Well, the Mormon church actually did that sort of thing, electroshock therapy at BYU. I'm not sure if this was the program that Kimball was referring to, 
and not sure if those general authorities were, were over that program, but that did happen. Uh, but Kimball does mention this re a rehabilitation program. All right, so homosexuality is curable. So they think of it as a disease. It is curable and forgivable. Certainly it can be overcome. For there are numerous happy people who were once involved in its clutches and who have since completely transformed their lives. Well, maybe for a short amount of time. But if that is... <laughs> If that is your nature, if you are a homosexual and that is what you desire, you cannot be cured. You are born that way. And so my guess is that almost all these people that were temporarily cured, quote unquote, were not cured uh, for very long of a period of time. And they went, they went back to those desires. I guess it could be compared to being a nun or a priest where you take a vow of celibacy, which is very difficult. And even a lot of nuns and priests, uh, as we know, have not been able to be celibate. All right, uh, Kimball continues here. Uh, Therefore, to those who say that this practice or any other evil is uncurable, I respond with the following. How can you say the door cannot be opened until your knuckles are bloody, till your head is bruised, till your muscles are sore, it can be done. So he frames this as a, a war. But really, it's not a war against homosexuality. It's a war against yourself. And you are going to break down. And it is going to be miserable. This war cannot be won. You are born gay. And no matter how hard you're how hard you fight you cannot be cured but that's not what Kimball says he says the opposite it he says it can be cured it can be done but it's a battle and he wants people to fight even until their knuckles are bloody till their head is bruised or till their muscles are sore I'm telling you it's still not gonna do any good all right Kimball says that homosexuality is an ill of our own begetting, so we just cause it by ourselves somehow, which must be corrected by ourselves. Healing from it comes from self-will. Good luck with that. Some of these homosexuals are uh, totally conquer homosexuality in a few months. Yeah, right. <laughs> Some totally conquer their homosexuality in a few months. All right, other homosexuals linger on with less power and require more time to make the total comeback. The cure is as permanent as the individual makes it. So it's all self-willpower. And like the cure for alcoholism, it is subject to continued vigilance. What a recipe for disaster and shame and guilt and suicidality. The cure is as permanent as the individual makes it. Like the cure for alcoholism, it is subject to continued vigilance. So you're, you're, every day, you're constantly fighting against your own inborn nature. All right. Many have been misinformed that they are powerless in the matter of their homosexuality, not responsible for the tendency, and that God made them that way. Yes, that is all true. <laughs> But Kimball says this is untrue as any other of the diabolical lies that Satan has concocted. So those, those ideas come from Satan, not from science. It is blasphemy. Man is made in the image of God. Does the pervert think that God is a homosexual or that God is that way? And it's interesting, he, he calls them perverts. Does the pervert think that God is a homosexual? Well, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know if God even exists. Uh, but if he does, he, I guess he could be any number of uh, sexual tendencies.
All right. So as you can see, he focused on homosexuality quite a bit in the book. Uh, but now we'll go on to some other topics. Uh, the husband should strive to be the perfect husband and the perfect father. Similar requirements are made of the wife. Well, good luck becoming perfect. Good luck hitting the bullseye every single time. Good luck even figuring out what perfection even means. All right, so what about the couple who doesn't want to have any children? Kimball says the couple who fails to have children is committing sin. Yes. So, again, they, the church wants you to believe that they believe in free agency. But every step of your life is planned out. It's not your choice whether to have children or not, if you're following the church. The church says, yes, you will have children. And that's what most Mormons do. If you don't, you're committing sin. All right, so we get into another problematic area here, the dealing with our thoughts. <clears throat> well, biologically, when we look at a beautiful woman, we are hardwired to have certain thoughts. It's simply a biological function. But Kimball says that those thoughts are not appropriate. Those thoughts can be sins. So here, here comes the, the massive shame and guilt over even thinking that a, a woman is beautiful. Looking at her breasts or her legs or her butt or whatever, as every man does, that's a sin. Uh, the thought that stirred the look, that provoked the lust, was evil in its beginning. When the thought is born, which starts a chain reaction, a sin has already been committed. Good luck ever perfecting those thoughts. They were not, we were not designed to perfect those thoughts. We are designed to be attracted to each other. All right, let's, let's talk a little bit about Cain. Uh, Kimball says that as a punishment for killing Abel, the Lord consigned the wicked Cain to be a fugitive and a vagabond and placed a mark upon him which would reveal his identity. And what is that mark? Well, of course, other Mormon leaders and even in the scriptures themselves, like in the Pearl of Great Price, it says that that mark was a black skin that was placed on Cain. And uh, then Kimball talks about how Cain is a fugitive and a vagabond and has roamed the earth ever since and uh, wishing he could die, but he cannot die. He's just roaming around uh, the earth for thousands and thousands of years. All right. Endless misery and suffering await the unrepentant sinner. So notice that word endless goes on forever and ever and ever. Well, I made a video about uh, Mormon hell and the three kingdoms of glory. And in there I talk about how even the lowest kingdom, the uh, telestial kingdom, is, is a great place to be. And that's been taught by Joseph Smith and a lot of other Mormon leaders. So since it is a pretty great place to be, this idea of endless misery that's talked about in the Book of Mormon and in the Bible, really isn't Mormon doctrine. Uh, there really is no hell for the average Mormon in Mormon doctrine. There's three kingdoms, and the lowest is, is pretty good. But Kimball, as a hardliner in this book, says that the sinner will await endless or eternal uh, misery. All right, so what happens to evil nations? Well, they get punished. Uh, and he gets this kind of stuff from the Bible and the Book of Mormon, but uh, it's pretty gruesome stuff. Uh, Kimball says that God can punish entire nations for sin. Kimball says that nations can be destroyed. Women will be raped and their inhabitants turned into slaves because of their sinfulness. And these sound like crazy ideas, but these are the ideas that are in the Book of Mormon and the Bible. Whole nations destroyed, like Sodom and Gomorrah. Their women ravished and raped, and their inhabitants turned into slaves. 
He talks about the city of Pompeii in Italy as being one of these cities. Uh, he says, due to their evil ways, the city of Pompeii was destroyed by God through the eruption of Mount Vesuvius. So this God can be very vengeful, very angry, and he will just wipe out a whole city. And, you know, he's even wiped out more than that in the past. He, he flooded the entire planet, according to the Bible, and killed everybody except for a few people that were on the ark in uh, Noah's family. So this is just gruesome stuff. All right, so he tries to scare the crap out of people so that they will uh, conform to the values of the church, not your own values, to the values they tell you. Sin results in remorse and sorrow, followed by pain and suffering, and finally torture. What a bastard God is to torture his own children. Uh, that just makes no sense to me. Makes no sense that there is torture on the earth. Makes no sense to me that there's all these super nasty diseases that people suffer with that are just horrible to live with. But it's okay for Kimball. Sin results in torture and distress in the exquisite degree. So he's, he's quite the hardliner here. Pictured above, I guess you, you could say this guy's being tortured through electroshock therapy, as they did at BYU. All right, Kimball calls homosexuality a sex perversion, which is addictive. So you, you can tell here he understands nothing of the scientific uh, information that, that we have about homosexuality. It's not an addictive thing. It's an inborn thing. Kimball says that people who see homosexuality as a normal activity are deviates. All right, Kimball also says that no one in prison can fully repent. By then it's too late. You know, you're not taking the initiative yourself. You're repenting so that you can look good in front of the guards and <laughs> in front of the judge and, and, you know, be able to get out of prison. So nobody in prison can fully repent. All right, another comment here about how we can become gods. Uh, Kimball says that we are gods in embryo with the seeds of godhood neatly tucked away in us, or him, and with the power to become a god eventually. Yay. All right, so uh, how should you respond if you're being raped? <laughs> well, this is a pretty controversial statement here. He says you should fight back. You should struggle. I'm not sure if that's the best thing you should be doing. You're probably going to get the crap beat out of you. But uh, in regards to rape, Kimball says the following. It is better to die in defending one's virtue than to live having lost it without a struggle. Better to, to die in defending your virtue than to live having lost it without a struggle. You fight back. No matter how hard that guy is beating you or, or torturing you or whatever he's doing, you fight back. I don't know. All right, another controversial statement here. Uh, Kimball says that couples who have committed fornication should seriously consider getting married, <laughs> which will hold the sin in one family. Why is that important? Why should they not marry when by their iniquitous act they have plunged themselves into an adult role? So just because they committed fornication, they should get married? What if they don't like each other that much? What if they're not compatible? What if that's not who they really want to marry? That doesn't matter. It's not about your freedom of choice, about who you want to marry. It's the fact that you committed fornication, and now the church is going to tell you, you better get married because you committed fornication. And for sure, if you get pregnant, right? If, if you get pregnant, then for sure the church is going to say, now you have to get married. All right, so how often do we need to repent? Well, Kimball says that it's 24-7. Every day, every hour, all of us are in need of constant repentance. What a life of misery. And again, he tries to scare the crap out of us 
by talking about the evil spirits that are working against us. So Satan is this really powerful uh, entity that is working against us. But there is probably hundreds of his demons, his evil spirits that are also working against us. So Kimball says there may, may be hundreds of evil spirits working against each of us. Hundreds of evil spirits on each of us. How terrifying. Accordingly, we must be alert constantly. Again, there's that word again, constantly. All right, so we're going to need constant vigilance because Lucifer knows the habits, weaknesses, and vulnerable spots of everyone. Yikes. He knows all my weaknesses. He's kind of like God, right? He's kind of all-knowing. He knows my habits. He can see into my bedroom and he can see that I'm masturbating. He knows my vulnerable spots. I'm vulnerable to becoming a homosexual because I masturbate. All right, so what causes unchastity and immorality? Well, it's the way people dress. <laughs> Kimball says that immodesty in dress encourages unchastity and immorality and maybe rape because women choose to dress a certain way does that mean that they're asking for it are they asking for unchastity and immorality and rape all right so here's one that i doubt very many mormons are keeping anymore the conservative times of the 1960s he says, I see young women and some older ones on the streets wearing shorts. This is not right. And pictured above, we have shorts above the knee. That is not right because the garments go below the knee. So she's committing sin. She's immodest. And wearing these shorts is going to lead to unchastity and immorality. And guys leering at her, right? The place for women to wear shorts is in their rooms, in their own homes, and in their own gardens. Yep, no more shorts, guys. All right, so the culture of rape, they call it. That it's the women's fault because of the way they dress. <laughs> Kimball, Kimball talks this way. So he says, I wonder if our sisters realize the temptation they are flaunting before men when they leave their bodies partly uncovered by wearing shorts. One example that he mentioned. Wearing shorts causes a temptation that they are flaunting before men. Well, what other things should a woman not do? Women should not dress in tight-fitting clothes. It's too much, it reveals too much of their body, he says. He says women should not wear form-fitting sweaters, as pictured above. What are you doing, flaunting yourself in front of men? Are you asking for it by wearing a form-fitting sweater? All this leads to the rape culture that we have today in the United States. All right, a little bit of advice for men. Kimball says that men should not do yard work or drive around in cars without their shirts on. You're going to be working out in the yard. You need to, need to put a shirt on. Women's backs and bosoms and lower limbs, in other words, their legs, should be covered. Again, no shorts. Cover your back, cover your bosoms, and cover your legs because you're causing too much temptation in the men. All right, uh, some more craziness here. Kimball quotes the Deseret News, a church-owned newspaper, an article stating that a high percentage of the crimes of today are traceable to the low-grade entertainment TV and movies watched by so many of the younger generation. <laughs> BS, a high percentage of the crimes of today are traceable back to what we're watching on TV and in the movies. Well, TV and movies have gotten more promiscuous. 
more sexual over time from 1969 to 2020. Well, uh, shows like The Office. <laughs> they uh, have quite a bit to say about uh, sex and, and jokes and, and whatnot. And crime has gone down. The UN, United States is safer now than it was in 1969. It's been steadily going down. So this is BS. Desert News is full of BS. Kimball's full of BS. All right, so you shouldn't be kissing your boyfriend or girlfriend until you're looking for an eternal mate. Kimball says that there should be no kissing until age 17 or 18 when teens are ready to look for an eternal mate in proper marriage. Yep. So, and then he would probably say no French kissing, no heavy necking. That should probably wait until you're married. All right. Kimball says that people in different religions should not get married. Those who do will have an increase in the problems of marriage. Really? Just right across the board universally? What about our free agency? Oh, you can do it. You're just going to be rebelling against the church and God and you'll be punished for your sins. But there's there's millions of people. I think 40% of the marriages now are interreligious marriages. People getting married that are, are different religions. That's normal with a lot of Christians, different versions of Christianity or even totally different religions. And people are finding ways to make it work. Millions and millions of people. Overall, will it maybe create a little more problem? A little more problems? Maybe. Uh, that's people's free agency. All right. Mixed marriages with spouses of different faiths generally bring a loss of spirituality. <laughs> yeah, right. People getting married with different faiths, they lose their spirituality. And divorce results very often along with much unhappiness. Is it really that much greater than the regular 50% rate of people in the same religions? I don't think it, it results in divorce very often. And Kimball says that such mixed religious marriages seldom work out that's bullshit <laughs> what is seldom 10 percent of the time they work out that's just nonsense all right so after you get married when should you have children well don't worry the church will tell you you got they got your whole life mapped out for you and it doesn't really matter what you want they're going to tell you when to have children. And they do. And the people listen and give up their free will. Kimball says that newly married couples should not postpone parenthood. Don't postpone it. Even if you're working on getting your medical degree or your law degree, just go ahead and have some children while you're doing that. Well, you can, get, you can get student loans to pay for them. Uh, so do not postpone parenthood. And and also family size should not be limited. Tiny little statement that he, he sneaks in there on page 250. Family size should not be limited. In other words, don't use birth control. And this is what they told people in the 60s. You're going to have as many children as nature wants you to have or as God wants you to have. So if that means 10 or 12, so be it. That makes it, uh, it is an economic disaster to, to try to support families that big. The church has had to back away from this. And I don't think they counsel people on how many kids they should be having anymore. But they used to. And this is a senior apostle giving this advice. This should be authoritative advice, right? It's not. Just like all these other slides we've shown, this senior apostle 
is talking nonsense. All right, some more statements on rape culture. This is a, these kind of statements are very controversial nowadays. I guess he got away with it in 1969. Women often invite men to sensual desire by their immodest clothes. Yes, we are inviting you in to sensual desire by the way we dress. You like that word? We are inviting men. What? They're asking for it. Their loose actions and mannerisms, their coy glances, their extreme makeup, as pictured above, and their flattery. Yeah, their extreme makeup is inviting men into sensual desire. So whose fault is it when men succumb to sensual desire or even rape? Well, it's obvious here, right? It's because of the women's clothes. It's the way they act. It's the, the way they look. Their makeup. The, the, the way that they look at, at men. Their flattery. All right. I guarantee you that leaders of the church nowadays are not going to use the word indoctrinate as a good thing. The church likes to indoctrinate its youth. In other words, brainwash them. <laughs> but Kimball uses the word in a positive way. He, he says indoctrination is a good thing. Well, what, is an in, what is indoctrination? It is to teach a person or a group to accept a set of beliefs uncritically. And that's what they do in the Mormon church. Accept the beliefs that we tell you Accept the crap that I wrote in this book uncritically. Don't think about it. Just accept it. To And also to imbue with a specific partisan or biased belief or point of view. So accept things uncritically. You're partisan. You're biased. This is all a good thing to Kimball. He says, in the home, the young people should be so indoctrinated a.k.a. brainwashed and fortified that the problems of the children and youth will be minimal. We're just going to do exactly what they say and we'll avoid all problems in life. Amazing statement. The young people should be indoctrinated. And pictured above, we have a teacher, I guess, clipping the thought bubble of the children into a Christian cross. In other words, destroy their own thinking patterns, their own free will, and indoctrinate them into Christianity. All right, so what is the job of the mother? What is the job of the woman? Well, Kimball tells you. <clears throat> Kimball says that couples should plan for the mother to stay home with the kids. That is, mothers should not have careers. Yep. <clears throat> your life is not your own. Your life is not about yourself. Your life is not about what you want to do. Whether or not you want to have a career or not, your job is to have kids and stay home with them. Period. Children cannot grow up properly disciplined under babysitters, no matter how good these may be. <clears throat> All right, so uh, Kimball, again, talks about indoctrination being a good thing. He says, with proper indoctrination, a boy is led to understand the course of his life. Sheesh. <laughs> yeah, but we, we really believe in free agency. He will be a deacon, a teacher, a priest, an elder. So all along the way, he's going to have the priesthood. He will attend his priesthood meetings and seminary. Well, that's that four years of high school. He will always go to Sunday school, always go to MIA, Mutual for the Youth. Always do his home teaching. 
Every boy has his life mapped out for him. I guarantee you in Sunday school and in priesthood meetings, they don't talk about your dreams, your goals, your values, your interests, what you want to do. Because they already know what every human should do, right? Every human clone should do the same thing. All right, so what's the rest of the plan for the young man? Well, he will, he will go and serve an honorable mission. I did it. And he will get his education. Yep, I did it. He will be married in the Holy Temple to a lovely Latter-day Saint girl. Didn't do that. <laughs> in the middle of my college, I figured out the joke, you know, the joke was on me, I guess, huh? I've been brainwashed. Oh, but brainwashing and indoctrination is a good thing. You got to go on your mission. You got to get your education. You got to get married in the temple. Then you got to uh, build up the kingdom of God for the rest of your life. That's your main goal. All right, no pressure here, but... Kimball says, we are commanded to be supermen. WTF. What the heck? We're supposed to be supermen? We are gods and embryo. And the Lord demands perfection of us. Yeah. So, sounds like a great time. Living the perfect life that the religion tells you to live and again uh, mothers should not have careers outside of the home you got to get by on one income well probably a lot of Mormon families found that impossible nowadays so a lot of them probably have two incomes now but they really weren't supposed to do that uh, according to Kimball Kimball says too many of our wives and mothers prefer the added luxuries of two incomes to the satisfactions of seeing children grow up in the fear and love of God. They love money more than they love God. They love money more than their children. So yeah, you don't get to choose whether you have two incomes. You don't get to choose whether or not you want children. Those are all decided for you. And, you know, ideally a mother should not have a career. What if she wants one? What if she wants to be a lawyer or a doctor? She can't do it? What if she doesn't want to have kids and wants to be a doctor? All right, so what about our military and our weapons of war? Or the defense industry? Well, if we just live righteously enough, God would protect us. But how is he going to protect us without any weapons? <laughs> I don't know. Kimball, Kimball kind of says here, page 318, that we don't really need weapons. We just need God. He says, why must men rely on physical fortifications and armaments when the God of heaven yearns to bless them? Men shun God and put their trust in weapons of war. Yeah, because those things work. All right, so again, uh, Kimball told a man who had committed adultery that it was the next most serious sin to murder. So again, he emphasizes that. We've talked about that. All right, so who has the power to remit sins? Who is authorized to absolve people from sin? Well, it is only one organization on the face of the earth. There's only one organization that can remit sins, and that is the Mormon Church. He says, since the power to remit sins is so carefully and strictly limited within the true Church of Jesus Christ, it is strictly limited to the true Church of Jesus Christ, the Mormon Church, where so many men bear the true priesthood of God it is monumental presumption, monumental presumption 
for unauthorized men elsewhere to claim to absolve people from sin. So any other religion doesn't have the power and authority to absolve people from sin. The only way we get remittance of sin is through the Mormon church. The pinnacle of arrogance. All right, so again, uh, how often should we repent? He gives us the answer constantly. <clears throat> Peace can be attained only through maintaining constantly a repentant attitude, seeking forgiveness of sins both large and small. Well, I know that's not true. I've obtained peace in my own life. And it wasn't through constantly repenting. All right, so that's going to do it for this video. Got a lot of controversial statements here by the senior apostle Spencer W. Kimball in his book, The Miracle of Forgiveness. And uh, yeah, what do you think? I, I think there's quite a few in here, quite a few things that if you believe them, they're going to make you miserable. If you believe in constantly repenting, you're going to be miserable. You're going to be filled full of shame and guilt your whole life. And, uh, you know, you're not going to be happy. You're going to be depressed. If you really take this hard line of Mormonism, which a lot of this they've gotten away from now, but a lot of it is still within the church. But that is going to do it for this video. And I thank you for watching the controversial statements in Spencer W. Kimball's book, The Miracle of Forgiveness video.